Alrighty, I'll call the order of the Title 21. It's August 5th, and we'll start with instructions. Mr. Trainee. Dick Trainee. Amy Domboski. Pete Peterson. Jaffrey Johnson. Bill Evans. Carol Wong, Long Range Planning. Wes Skinner with Morning Lights. John Todd, Glacier Sign. Jason Shockley, Broadway Signs. Jack Shockley, Great Broadway Signs. Okay. Good day. Alrighty. Um, the first thing we'll do is just take a look at the agenda for today. Um, it's pretty packed. As we can see, um, I have invited multiple members from the sign community to come in and weigh in on the proposed ordinance. Um, so they're here with us today. Um, we need, do need to discuss the committee mission statement. Um, and then, you know, regarding AO 2015, 76, and 59, um, I talked to Mr. Hall a little bit yesterday, and we just kind of wanted a status update from Mr. Evans since you guys had been talking, I think, and just kind of see where we're at with those two because uh, my understanding was there's kind of a merged version that's going to be happening. So um, we'll talk about that. And then on the agenda two, um, these are just our idea last meeting was to start listing things that we all had heard potentially might be issues. So this, under the August 12th, this is just a rough list. I don't anticipate everything there could possibly be discussed in an hour and a half, but just kind of giving the idea of where the committee wants to go first. Um, and then um, August 19th, we had talked about potentially um, having the final um, industrial land report and that presenter coming back in. Um, and I'm glad Mr. Train is here because we can talk about maybe doing a committee as a whole. Alrighty. Um, with that, um, we'll start with member comments. And Mr. Evans, you just got back from a whirlwind trip, so we're all dying to hear. Oh, yeah. I, uh, we just went to Wichita and Oklahoma City and looked at what they were doing as far as development goes. Um, and there was just a lot of information. They're both very uh, impressive cities, um, Wichita being a little more close to our size and Oklahoma City being quite a bit bigger. Uh, but both had gone through significant uh, periods of decline and, and had gotten together to try to spur development. Uh, the trip focused mostly on housing, but included some other development as well, generally. Um, I think the Rasmussen Foundation is going to have a press release and stuff on it, and so they've asked us not to get out in front of them on any specific details, but it was an informative trip. I thought it was really useful. Oh, got some good, good ideas. Good. Well, I can't wait to hear them. So, just you know, we we're talking about TIF and Oklahoma City. <clears throat> Did anybody talk about the impact of the housing bubble? Was a TIF pre or post housing bubble? Uh, for, at least for Oklahoma City, which was the one that was using the TIF the most, it was pre housing bubble. And and the effects, the economic effects. Uh, Is that <coughs> somebody going to? merge that data and get it I mean just so we I mean that's that's a great case study of what works and what doesn't work and, and um, so I yeah I mean they'll be all I mean the all the data that was gathered from both the locations we put out there the administration say what it wants about it but all right um, Ms. Johnson do you have any comments before we start welcome back by the way thanks Mr. Peterson uh, nothing right now, Madam Chair. Alrighty. Um, Mr. Trainee. Nothing, ma'am. Okay. So let's move on to um, really quickly the mission statement. Has anyone had a chance to consider? Um, I haven't seen the, any emails. Did you send me one? No, I don't, oh. I don't think I've seen the mission statement. Yeah, well, that was the point. Was okay. It was supposed to be collaborative. Oh, okay. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. No, you're um, I know I, um, there's been discussions with the clerk and the chair, and um, we are more than happy to draft one and um, put it before the committee. But oh, I was hoping committee members would send their ideas. I did not. Okay. Well, if you have any, otherwise you get what I give you. <laughs> Mr. Trainee. Barbara's working on that today, and she'll send to me, I'll send it to you, and then reach concurrence, we'll send out to all the Sunday members. Okay. It's going to be happening today. So. Perfect. Perfect. Welcome. Welcome. Chris, thank you can answer. Yeah, thank you. Um, and for the record, Chris Judy is with us with the mayor's office and John Wells. He's traveling to Pendant. Yes, sir. Great. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and launch right into 2015-83. Um, 
There are agendas. There's an amendment that was uh, amended this document. That's what I had passed out to you while Mr. Evan was giving his report. Um, the amendment, um, and that's what was passed by the assembly last meeting. That amendment. Ignore the chicken scratch in the, in the margin. That's just here. So, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> comment on the bottom prepping my thoughts okay so with that said um, Erica um, you see we have a, a bare table today so I had gone through yesterday and um, went through the yellow pages basically and called every sign company I could see just to see if they had to, if they knew anything about this if they had any thoughts or advice um, and I was surprised that um, I didn't come across anyone that under that knew this was being discussed so with that, I invited them to come today just to ask questions or maybe lend advice um, or suggestions to be part of it. So in a quick couple minute recap, can you just kind of explain to um, uh, the member, the members of the public here today um, just what the intent was behind this and kind of what you think it does? Sure. Um, it uh, attempts to tackle two issues. One is the um, general uh, confusion that seems to exist around what is an architectural feature and what counts as an architectural feature and thus what as an architectural feature can be exempted from sign area and I know that um, the municipal staff and um, sign designers have had some conflict about that issue over various sign designs um, and since the code tells us that an architectural feature has to be something that enhances the site and, and it, it requires a measure of interpretation that um, we find, or we believe, is not really appropriate for the staff to be taking on that interpretation, and, and we think that there should be a clear and measurable standard. And if you meet the standard, you get, you know, if you're within the sign area, you um, get your sign permit. So what we proposed was to remove the provision that creates this, you know, exemption for an architectural feature, and increase the sign area for freestanding signs by 10% in all the districts. Uh, so that was the first change. And then the second change is that um, the sign code does not address menu boards and ordering screens for drive through restaurants. Um, and since they are neither, they don't really quite fit the definition of instructional signs, but they're also not the kind of freestanding sign that goes on the property boundary to tell people that the business is there, they're, they just aren't really dealt with in the code. So we proposed to add them in and say that um, they are permitted and we uh, proposed a limitation on their size that was based on the uniform sign code. Um, that included a um, percentage of uh, business identification like logo area which we're not wedded to <laughs> at all um, but that was what was in the uniform sign code so we just carried that forward. Um, so to try to uh, legitimatize ordering screens and menu boards um, and what we found is that the ones that we had been reviewing recently fit easily within the proposed limitations. So th that was the intent of the ordinance to address those two issues. And then um, I brought the pictures. I don't know if, the, if you want to speak to those and oh, show, show sure. those around. Well, so we, we, we discussed this. One of the, the things that the committee um, is finds is, is, is wrestling with and I, not just with signs but with Title 21 in general I think is how to, the issue of being prescriptive measurable versus flexibility and discretion and we're, what's the right balance between those two things and um, one of the issues that we had with where a, a lot of um, discretion is given to staff. So, and Mr. Evans, I hope you don't mind if I just use your amendment as an example, but Mr. Evans proposed to remove the um, measurable area requirement for menu boards and ordering screens and just say that they are no larger than necessary to serve the intended instructional or functional purpose. Well, that gives the staff really no guidelines. And so one of the other things that we feel can happen is that if a mistake is made and something gets approved, if you have no kind of standards by which you're judging stuff, then you've set the, the staff has set a precedent, and it's very, we can't really walk back from that precedent. So in this particular example, 
this frame around the target sign was determined to be an architectural feature by someone who was kind of filling in. They didn't have a lot of experience reviewing this, and so they were filling in for somebody who was out. And so once that was an architectural feature, we got pushed to say frames around other signs were also architectural features because we had approved it in this situation. So you know, how can we not approve it in this other situation? And that is, to me, one of the pitfalls of giving a, a, a lot of discretion um, a, without some sort of guidelines about you know, how to use that discretion. So from my perspective, I have urged the committee to be careful about when they want to give staff discretion um, and, and not also thinking that um, having something measurable makes, especially when it's something to me that seems pretty simple, like menu boards and ordering screens, um, having something that's measurable makes it a lot faster for us to review and approve a permit request. Whereas once you um, put in a lot of discretion that can take some time and there can be some back and forth and that sort of thing. So, sorry, I put my perspective in there. That's okay. I appreciate it. And just for the record, Mr. Weaver's joined us. Okay, so so with that said, um, I want to start with um, industry comments. So, um, anybody want to pipe up? Please state your name for the record and what company you are with. And then, go ahead. Jack Shockley with Broadway Sign Company. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, I understand the difficulty that they're in because I deal with it all the time. Uh, and they do a great job. We always seem to be at the counter working the details. And this is on everything, not just flourishes. But, but with that being said, we're dealing with art. We've got to keep that in mind. We're, we're saying signs, but we're actually looking at the art part of the sign. We can all build square boxes, and if we're not careful, that's what we're going to end up with. This is your square box. No architectural features. The signs become ugly because they're just square. The person that she said reviewed these, and I don't know if she saw these pictures, was absolutely correct. It's beautiful to have wood around a sign. It's, I don't know if you've seen this sign. That's a beautiful looking sign. Without her including that flourish, the sign would not look like this. So what we're discussing here is the pretty part of the sign. I have another drawing right in here I'd like to show you that follows the same same. It's difficult. The sign area is the box that's in here. Everything on the outside of that that has no text is the flourish. Whether it's pictures of whales or birds or something like that, that's all art. It doesn't do anybody any real advertisement, I mean, it, you don't see Joe's Cafe on the side of this thing. So it's not the sign area. So my point today was uh, I'm all about flourishes and, and architectural features that ties the sign to the building. I think it's vital. Difficult, yes, but vital. Or we're gonna end up with very ugly signs that are just one shape, one color, pole covers. I was, uh, since the beginning, I was all about pole covers because it hides that pole. You don't get the lollipop thing. Textured. The addresses are appearing on them now. So as far as architectural features, I know it's difficult, but I think it's 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 really important that we keep the interpretations to anything outside the sign area that makes the sign look pretty is an architectural feature. So that's kind of where I stand on that. On her other point of drive throughs Drive-throughs are um, defined spaces on the sides of restaurants. We are now going into the point where they're showing pictures because we have the technology is caught up. Before it was just a little line item that said eight bucks. Now you get a picture of what you're ordering. And I'm happy about that. To tell you through that, I order all pictures. I, I really don't read all the stuff. It's like, I want that hamburger for whatever it is. Graphics take space. I, I sent an email out, but these are self-regulating areas. They're not a meant. They're not meant to advertise to the street. They are really consolidated against the building, and they're all about ordering. These are designed by professional people that says this is what we need 
to show them to order. Along with this area is also the clearance bar that is part of it. There's the ordering screen now, which is separate from the menu board. The sizes that I saw for what they were talking about doing was way too small. If you measure any of them, they're, they're like, they're like six and seven feet wide by eight foot tall to get all the pictures on there and the menu boards the way they need to be. I really don't think that we need to regulate everything. Some things are self-regulating. I mean, if they try to put a sign on facing the street along the parallel, that's a pole sign. That's a different subject. But the drive-through clearance, and if you look at them, they're all the same, and they all do the exact same function. When Taco, was it Taco? No, it was Starbucks, redid their drive-through signs, I came in to get permitting for them, and zoning did not have any rules to cover it, which was fine. We did go through a structural review to make sure the bases were adequate. Other than that, it was very simple signage. Menu board, reader, ordering board, clearance bar. Thank you, exit this way. So I don't think everything needs to be regulated. So that's my comments on those two issues. Are there any questions for Jack? Next up. Well, I uh, was involved. Again, could you say your name? Oh, I'm sorry, record? John Todd with Glacier Sign. Um, I was involved in the, the Takata Commons one, and it did go through quite a process. It went through uh, the desk, and we had wow. to do multiple changes in this sign from taking the structural steel, which we were going to have run through these side sections here. We had to move them into the sign to prove that it was not an integral part of the sign that's an addition to make it an architectural feature, which we did, and easy enough, it could be this box, like Jack stated, it could end up being a big box. If we increase the, you know, the, the size to add architectural feature, I would prefer that you stated it as architectural feature can be added, and you, you don't have to regulate, they don't have to determine, but the sign area is this, and I think 10% is too small for adding, you know, because usually you'll have a cap on top and some little side details, which will, it, it does, it, it enhances the site, it enhances the sign. Um, you know, and most building owners are, are just going for the impact of the, the, for their tenants. So if it comes down to they want to enhance the site, but they're not going to give up their tenants' uh, readability from the highway to do so. So if you get all the tenants in here, you have this square box with a pole sticking out. I do believe on both cases that these are nicer looking signs, and that's what we try to do. It's better for our industry. We can, uh, the, the signs, you know, we get more money for them. The, it enhances the site. It, I think that Anchorage looks better when we do this type of stuff. So I feel, and, and I can see their point of view coming from trying to interpret architectural feature and stuff like that. It gets kind of a tough thing to do. But I think that limiting it to just 10% is pretty tough because that would just be like one section of this side right here is about 10% of the thing. So that would leave out the cab, that would leave out the other side. It doesn't leave you a lot to enhance the sign in general. Out of curiosity, was that the max size sign that you could place there as a freestanding? Max size sign includes this area here, and then the empty space below this right here is the sign area. So I'm just that curious if you that one eventually you, you went to the max on this particular yeah. sign. Yeah, it, as max as we could go with the way the lamps had to be ran into the sign and stuff like that. So all this was uh, architectural features. Right? And how many freestanding signs are there in Tukatka? Tukatka has four. Complex for only four signs. Yeah, yeah, it is a huge complex. 
Are there any questions for assembly members, Mr. Todd? Well, I'm saying I'll mind until the end. Mm -hmm. you know, I have comments. Just state your name for the record and your company, please. Wes Skinner. I'm with Morning Lights of Alaska. Um, we have a operating su subsidiary called Action Sign and Graphics. You'll primarily know Warning Lights as the people who do highway signs. We're the prime contractor for DOT. Um, we do a lot of work with the city. Um, if it's a sign alongside the roadway, we probably manufactured and did the layout design. I send my customers who need electrical signs to these two gentlemen, uh, these two businesses, um, because we're not an electrical sign shop. So right away, I want you to understand I'm not, I'm not going to speak to the strengths that they're talking about with this. Um, a major portion of what I do for customers, though, uh, whether I'm doing designs for aircraft, for flat signs on buildings, for highway signs, for parking lot signs, is we define readability. We define what's your moving speed, what, when do you encounter the image on the sign, and how large does that need to be in order for the person <coughs> in the vehicle, where we're doing vehicle-oriented signs, to react. The signs we're talking about, even these ones at Takatanu, are signs that are designed to orient people in the vehicle either to the destination or having arrived at the destination with the example of menu reader boards. Um, the small space really that you can see out the window of the vehicle if you think about this. And I, I want you to relate it this way. Um, think about the last time you were at the airport and didn't line up correctly going into the parking garage and are trying to reach out and grab the ticket. And now you're having to open your door and, and reach a little further. It's really it sounds huge when we talk about these spaces, but it's really a very small space that you're encountering to have these images show up, which is why the new reader board technologies are going to the pictures that, like Jack was talking about, where you, you have a, a kiosk as you're in queue and you see what the options are, and then as you pull up to order, it's a condensed version, and they're showing you pictures to, to make sure that you've got the transaction right. It speeds the transaction time up, cuts down the number of vehicles idling in a lane, um, it makes sure that you have accuracy with employees who are um, increasingly, people in these businesses have a, a hard time making sure their employees are getting choices right because each of these businesses is amplifying the number of choices. So they're, they're clearing a whole bunch of information in a very small space in a low speed encounter point. Um, I would suggest to you that the, the menu board signs are, are principally self-regulating. You just can't get very big because the car doesn't have very much room to see it. And the encounter spaces you come up, if you think about this and the person next to you in the vehicle is trying to read the sign as well across, and they're looking at the menu board signs that are in place, the kiosk signs before they encounter the order point, there's just so much you can have in place before you can't have any more. Um, and your best validation for this is the national chains. McDonald's, for example, use the, the old dog. They've got it schooled nationwide on how big, how big they can get away with before people are overwhelmed by where things are. And again, I relate it to yourself. The last time you pulled up and you wanted to order a drink and a, and a sandwich, and you're trying to chase across the whole menu board and see it. So it, it's almost self-regulating. You do need boundaries. I, I believe it's wrong, and I fully support planning's position. It's wrong to put a staff person in a place where there's not an outer boundary limit. But Jack has also pointed out that the signs are, are oriented towards the vehicle that's arriving and that it's really easy to, to grasp the boundary when the sign orientation now turns itself towards the street. I would suggest that um, planning would catch it right away if the menu board with its reader deal was oriented towards the street so that when there was no vehicle there, there was a flashing message going on. One of the issues we have constantly is trying to tell customers when you have a reader board sign, there's only so long the message can be up. You can't just keep repeating. We can't do that with our message boards for traffic. It's irritating. You're driving towards a message board. Road closure ahead. And you're driving too fast if you get to it before it cycles on its third time, by the way. But that, that's really, that's an illustration of how self-regulating this stuff is. So, yes, you have to give staff some boundaries. We need boundaries. I, I do very few permits. I'm KG. I make my customers pull their permits, but I have to fully equip them with the information so that they go away and save money by encountering planning. And that means that they have to have all the answers so that when they encounter planning for their little signs that I do, um, they have to be ready to, to go through the grid of questions that's going to be asked. And planning does a very good job with the information they've got right now. Um, I caution you on deliberately vague language like as necessary. And, and it's here's my encounter with as necessary. Is there a speed limit? 
speed limit 25, or is it speed limit as necessary? I was almost late for the start of the meeting. I was thinking, how fast can I drive across Dowling to get here as necessary? And that's what I wanted to illustrate for you. So, in the balance, the architectural features, I want to flash you back to something. I'm a graduate of, of uh, Bartlett High School. Bartlett had wonderful lunches back in the, the late 70s and early 80s. You had an hour and a half. You could leave campus and go to lunch. We would pour out of the school and drive down Muldoon Road. Do you remember what the signs used to look like on Muldoon Road? Muldoon Road was not a model picture of, of how um, sign development should have occurred. And, was a poster child for how planning went in and came up with things like the, the pole covers. Like Jack's talking about pole cover, now you locate address on there and people can find you with the address, not just the sign. Um, there wasn't a lot of attention to detail even in the, the things that most of us never think about with a sign, which is what's under the ground. They're tipping all over the place. Please let's remember that the architectural details that we decided we needed based on and I hate to pick on Muldoon Road, but it's such a classic. Muldoon Road, the way it used to look, is not what we want the city to look like in any way, shape, or form anywhere else. As a guy who owns three mortgages in the city, I'm way interested in property value. I want my property value to go up. I want my customer's property value to go up. And when I refer a customer to drive by another business to see how the sign I'm proposing look on that business, I want it to look stellar, and I want it to look like the city was thrilled with the, the fringe things that most of us don't think about when we encounter signs. So that, that's my push for you when you're considering this is um, think about how that menu board is self-regulating because there's only so much you can see. It's targeting how we're approaching so it needs to be at a certain size. Um, for example, you may not know this, the US DOT numbers you see on the bottom doors of trucks has to be visible at 50 feet. Companies have actually sued State Department of Transportation because they don't define what that is. They've actually added back into the regulation usually two inches tall, but you can get away with an inch and a half. So see when you leave that as necessary or you define something that's vague, you run into all kinds of problems. How do we make that fit? And so it's better to give planning the tool and to give us sign companies a tool. But remember, when you give those tools, you don't want it to be a tool that's going to lead us down the road towards a, a reverse to a Muldoon Road philosophy where make it as big as you can with as little support stuff as possible because we want our sign to be big. Instead, make it something that's gonna enhance the property value of every business around it and that's gonna make the people who live in the neighborhood and travel to the neighborhood feel like they aren't being overwhelmed by a bunch of pole signs, but instead, architecturally pleasing stuff. And that's my Ms. Johnston, I have a couple questions. One, I, I kind of feel you're dancing back and forth between market-driven mm -hmm. and and setting up some parameters or, mm -hmm. or you know having somewhat prescriptive. And and it seems from what all three of you have said that that the use of the sign pretty much sets up the prescriptiveness of it. In other words what you're trying to do, um, the height of the light lettering, the size of the sign, you can just go so big and, and we, you know, so the big, the big signs on the barns aren't there anymore. Um, but you do say, you keep saying you and, and the market seems to be maturing beyond the Muldoon look. Was that the market or was that what was done by planning? It's driven two ways. If you've got a property owner who is leasing, he's built a building and he's leasing to tenants. Mm -hmm. um, think to Cotton Commons, mm -hmm. a remarkable development if you all the way through. Um, and to Cotton Commons is an outdoor map, <coughs> so now you've got an added function. You know, you're not inside with a little kiosk, look at the map, take the map and go where you go, like Fifth Avenue. Instead, you have a need for people to be able to see across the mall. So they have outside signs, plus they have the kiosks that set up the sections. So the people who are leasing that had to, in order to attract people like Target, they have to make enough sign space available that Target's gonna say, okay, I'm getting my pull. At the same time, um, you've gotta understand that today with the way we can build LED lit signs on the inside and so forth, we can conform to a lot of the things that's being asked for out of Title 21, it's tight. But where you, 
where you don't want to be too restrictive is in helping that sign, with as big as it needs to be, also have some function that makes it tie into the whole property and makes the property look like it was thought out. Yeah, it's a balance, and I'm telling you there's a balance, but what I, what I want you to do when you give staff boundaries is to make sure that you understand the boundaries need to be thought out from the perspective of, of how that business is going to mature. Um, I guess let me let me go further because I mean, and, and we do, Mr. Evans and I have done quite a bit in the last month talking about this kind of language as necessary or you know and, and I, I understand I mean we've spent seven years trying not to be subjective so then we get prescriptive you know I mean we're just back and forth but is there I mean and you tried to use an industrial standard when you first is that the approach you should take is is going to the industrial standard what was the purpose of Title 21 in the first place? I'm going to ask a question back. What's the whole purpose of Title 21 as it, as it relates to these items? It was, I mean, you know what? This, this is what the industry is asking you. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, Title 21 was, was conforming to our comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan was to enhance the image of the city mm -hmm. and to make the city um, attractive and from the purely mechanical standpoint of the tax base, make the city a place where businesses wanted to locate and, and build a future for themselves. With that, you have to allow businesses that are that are carrying the lion's share of that, um, you have to allow them to go to the maximum. I, I think an over-the-top example would be a Cabela's store. There is a lot of eye candy at a Cabela's store. Um, and outside that, or inside? Outside. I'm speaking just outside because this is related to outside stuff. Um, the directional signs on the outside of the store do a very good job at keeping, for example, if there's a 18 by 24 sign telling you where, where you can park, they keep their logo to a minimum at the top and the rest of the information is related to the message. Um, yet they have to be able to brand stamp and brand identify around. Um, if you think of the Cabela store and the location it's in, it's a piece of eye candy. It's in the middle of an incredibly ugly, from retail standpoint. Soon, soon to be developed. Yeah, but, but that area around there, chain link fence and businesses, and what I've got behind my chain link fence is not your business to tell me about. I'll park a wreck truck in there if I need to. Oh, because, you know some of the owners. Yeah, well, <laughs> I got a business that looks just like that. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's the balance you're striking with this. And you, know, you, have, to give, you have to give the market some ability to Flex its its marketing power. So so with branding, I'm sorry, but you know with branding, logos are a form of art, mm -hmm. and 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 we've already had just a little discussion here between art versus the frame of a sign is a form of art. Um, I mean, I guess. Yeah. Where so you? what is I mean? So as necessary maybe isn't the right term, but you we, you know. I, I mean, I've always been saying that the the city is maturing, so our market is maturing, and so it's, you know, the sign industry is maturing to the market. But so I don't quite, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but you're not giving us any wording or any. And, and just to follow up, once you're done, I'd like to ask John Huddleton a question. So, so from the as necessary perspective, you want a definition of what as necessary is? Mm -hmm. Or no, <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Is, yeah. John, John's telling you how 10% is difficult. Okay, let's say you've got a sign that is 10 feet wide and 40 feet high. What's 10% of that that you're going to allow then as an add-on for? If it's 10%, how many square feet? 40 square feet. Okay, that's four foot by 10 foot. Or, oh wait, we've got to put it on two sides and across the top. So now we're down to or under a foot for design, element, for design element around the outside to <laughs> make the sign not look like we're giving a you sign. a huge possible sign without any architectural element with it. See how? Yeah. So as necessary is nice, but then let's let's go to the counter. I come in to see you. And here's the challenge because she's got to teach her staff what constitutes as necessary. If I build a mountain that captures your attention as you're driving along and my sign is to the biggest possible, extent inside that mountain. Where is as necessary? 
Uh, obviously, we're beyond the 10%, but 10% is too small for what the biggest allowed space is. Would, do you have a figure that might be better for what you end up with? I have about 50%. Yeah. 50? Yeah. I want to go to Jack I really quick because I know he wanted to tag on. I can tell before you go to John. I just wanted to make a statement. <coughs> like any construction project, the guy that's paying for it wants to pay the least amount, mm -hmm. right? So for them, this all this extra stuff costs extra money for them to make it pretty. Anytime I can get somebody to do this, I want them to do it. Not just because I make more money, it's because it makes a beautiful sign. Normally this sign would look like this little square right here with a pole cover on the bottom, and that's what's required. To answer your question, the the sign ordinance that we have right now has hit the line perfectly as far as what's needed for sign areas. I think they're very comfortable. Uh, uh, this flourish stuff is extra for the customer. He's paying extra, and it's what's making the signs more beautiful. The more that we can get people to do this, the better as a city we are. That's the way I look at it. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting, this discussion between staff and, and what this flourish is. I relate that to a, a house and your, you know, what you do as far as the trim around doors or windows or columns is similar you know it's a simple it's a simple almost simple roman kind of look the classic look that is our but yeah what yeah. you're having a problem with is that the actual sign area that they are of that we cannot ex ex exceed uh -huh. is this yeah so we have to keep the signs big enough to be red. Right. And right now our sign ordinance is right on the mark. We can't. <coughs> I got a customer that has 28 tenants in his thing, and I've got to build a sign for 28 tenants. It's very difficult. Their panels are only this big. So we don't want to shrink sign areas down because they're at the minimum now. So by this not being counted as the sign area, it allows us to make the sign more attractive without making it a lot smaller and becoming ineffective. Erica, did you have a comment? I did. I just I feel like the land use interest in regulating signs is regulating the size of the structure. It's not regulating the content or the size of the content because you can have, you know, six or eight or ten or twenty-eight businesses advertising in this area or you can have one that's going to be much bigger and that's not what we're regulating we're regulating the size of the structure so I get very nervous when we talk about having a size for the content and then anything outside of that can either be unlimited or can be you know 50% bigger but there's some sort of judgment call again about is it art or not art so to me the land use interest in this is having structures that are reasonably sized, that are not blocking views, and that are kind of fair and consistent for everybody. Can I just ask John Weddleton a question? Mr. Weddleton, you're up. I remember a couple of years ago, as you went through the whole sign ordinance on your business. Do you have anything you can add to this discussion as far as this? Didn't you put in a new sign for the Bosco? You, I remember you testifying as far as the sign ordinance changes. I did year, it's been a while, um, and I think I was one of the first people to come through and get a permitted sign, and it was a little convoluted then because they were trying to figure it out, but it wasn't hard, it's not expensive. It went fairly smooth. I, I remember other, some other comments, so. Yes, so. All right, yeah, yeah. I remember it. Yeah. Uh, anyways. So I just want to, I want to go back to um, this amendment. So. Um, the amendment that you see before you, this is as necessary. This was incorporated into the document and the document was changed. So you were you were sent yesterday the, the regular, the introduced ordinance, and I want you to know right now that the assembly has changed this ordinance to say as necessary. Um, now, ultimately, the entire ordinance failed, but it is being reconsidered at the next meeting. So I want to hear definitively from industry, if you had an option, would you support the amendment as necessary? Would you support the document 
before it was amended, maybe with a changing of the sign? Or do you think we need to basically go back to the drawing board? I, I, we need a path forward. And, um, you know, like I said, your voice was a voice that was missing. Um, so it's helpful to get the feedback, especially because you're the ones that are here every day dealing with the department and understanding, you know, intimately what the issues are. I've got a, I've got a couple more pieces to bring to the table. Jason, go ahead. Say your name for the record, please. Jason Shockley, Broadway Science. Uh, just to touch on a couple points. One is big words makes it extremely complicated. I completely agree with that. I speak me is better for all of us. Uh, primarily on the architectural futures, one that we have in in the mill right now that has actually been approved brings up two points. One, this beautiful flag-mounted sign would lose either the top or the bottom if the figure stayed at 10%, and the sign would get a little smaller, which would actually go smaller than the regulation of the minimum height and maximum height. So that percentage is, it is it's way too small for what it is for our current sign codes. Okay, so you're, okay. The second problem is there's a piece in here that states that we could actually go back, or the municipality could go back on our permit and make a minor change on this approved permit. The sign is built and ready for install and it'll be installed in the next week. And it would cost our customer quite a bit of money to remove it, considering it's part of the structural and the flourish. We, we wouldn't do that. If you have an approval, if this passes, that will have no effect on permits that have already been approved. So I'd so. love to see that line go away. <laughs> okay, so you're specifically talking, can you look at the ordinance for me and show me what? So this I, I think, I think he, they, they, they just got the amendment, so they just have to look at The top and the bottom of the flag sign is highlighted uh, <laughs> for <laughs> this is something that you would apply for. So if you had applied for a site plan review or a conditional use or something and you wanted and you had an approval and you wanted to make a change, you would then apply for a minor amendment. This is not there's um, language in chapter 1 which says if you have an approved um, an approved permit or, or a pr approval that you're good to go. Good. Promise. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Second, uh, on the increase for freestanding signs and residential building signs, it all says 10%. But under the charts that were described, nothing shows anything for commercial or industrial building signs. So if we were to increase any percentages, I'd love to see those included in there as well. Commercial districts. Or uh, freestanding. Freestanding, yeah. The building yeah. signs were. were no, we didn't change the building signs, just the freestanding. Correct. Well, we'd love to put flourishes on building signs as well. John? Comments on the, on the um, ordinance as amended, the ordinance itself, or path forward? The path forward for me would be just looking at the pylon signs and as stated, to, I'm a graphic designer, a graduate of the Art Institute of Seattle. I want these signs to look beautiful. That's I want our city to look beautiful. And I think that if we just don't have the additional architectural features, it's gonna it's gonna go away. And I don't want that. I mean, and I don't think anybody here wants that. Um, I think. They're on the right track for the it's calling it an addition to the 200 square foot, but I think it needs to be 50 percent more or 50 percent of the whatever's legal in that area. So instead of 10 percent, it would be 50 percent. And it's not saying that it's going to happen. I mean, out of the what the 12 years that the sign code has been in, these are the two that we ran into it on in our company, and we do a you know, two and a half million dollars worth of signs a year. So that's not a lot for the signs that come out that run into any sort of issue with it. And I don't know if anybody else has ever ran into it. There's other sign companies, but you know, it's 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 not it's 
pretty much a non-issue until it comes up on the counter. I'm sure they don't want to have to, and that's why they want to make it so it's has a constraint to where they can follow a guideline, which I completely understand. I just think the 10% is too small going forward. I, th I think 50% would be adequate to put a framing to, that incorporates the building's architectural, and that's what we're usually looking at when we're doing it. We're trying to find a feature on the building to make it cohesive between the two so it, it looks like a great set. So that's what we're doing as designers to going forward whenever we get something in a lot of times we'll show them here's what you can have you know here's your, your your square footage being the 200 the square that some people that's all they want to do and then we add something on there to make them want to go further to enhance their site so and a lot of people go for that when they add that on to it so they're not losing their advertising value and in signs, it's the most economical advertising value for any business. So if we can do both at the same time, that's that's the route I would like to go. I appreciate that. Wes. I, I'm, I completely agree with what John said. The, I think we've got, um, we've got good review policies in place for the sky pollution issue, which is definitely something that Title 21 has helped with making sure that we don't have signs obscuring other stuff. I look at this all the time, traffic signage, parking lot signage, you know, you put a stop sign up with a sign in front of it that blocks a stop sign. Now, now you've invited lawyers into the party. And so when you're thinking about that from building signs that um, are going to enhance the value of one property, we're always looking to see what it does to the people coming the other way and is, is the sign useless because it's blocked by foliage or by buildings or something else is there. That, that's all taken into consideration and staff does a good job down here in planning with it. Um, if, if we're going to set boundaries, we need to set boundaries large enough that allows for um, not so much the commercialization of the property, but the enhancement of the property. So whether it's commercial, um, uh, government, school, uh, we, have, we have lots of nonprofit property here in the city. Um, that it's got the ability to take and put an architectural feature to the sign that that makes it look like it was designed into the entire piece of property and not just a pole sign that's put up with a little bit of camouflage to hide how it's hanging there. Um, there's, you know, I, I like to speak in generalities like that, but tell you, you know, you have to give staff some boundaries because what we also want to do is limit the time that we're in conflict resolution. And, you know, that's never a good thing for either side. So. Um, John has proposed 50%. I think if you consider the sign pictures that you've been shown, um, I would ask you, is there anything wrong with what was done with that Calais sign in terms of enhancing the property at, at the detriment of anything around it? It, it was considered a, an extreme frontier point, and yet if you look at the sign on the site, it makes the site look very attractive. Uh, one of the ways to think about it is if you had a business and you wanted to locate to this property buy out who's there, would the sign structure in place and the way the property is set up be something that you feel like you could pop your business into and be communicating with the public the next day? The alternative, which many of our customers consider, and I, I just shudder at the number of times it occurs, is they letter the side of a vehicle or a van and park it. And there's this vehicle or van parked out there because they feel like they weren't able to enhance their ability to communicate with the public. So now what we have is something that if not properly maintained, ends up looking like an abandoned vehicle with their name on it sitting out on the corner of the lot. And folks, that's that's a reality of what people do if they don't get the opportunity to establish a something that looks like we've got a nice business here. So. Yeah, it, it just seems that uh, my concern about the the fifty percent is that adding the the ten percent to the square area of the sign. Uh, was a way of getting around having to d deal with architectural feature and we just give you 10% more and you can work with it as the way you want. If we go to 50%, obviously it gives you the idea to put the uh, air, the ability to put together nice signs like the Calais sign and others that would be pleasing. But also, I would think that it also, if you don't want to use it, because it doesn't require an architectural feature to get that extra sign, so basically it would increase the size of, if we do it that way, you could take this sign, take away the architectural feature, and make the dang, the ugly part of the sign bigger, 50% bigger, which doesn't seem to be in anybody's interest. 
So it seems to me that the best approach is really sticking with the architectural feature idea, mm -hmm. as you know, subjective as it may be at times, um, without increasing the ability of those who want to just maximize their sign to do so. That would be my concern. It wasn't that what That's you were what saying. I, that was what you were saying. Too, yes. Yeah. Having the architectural feature on top of what is the right. existing sign. Yeah. I, so I don't think there was yeah. any Because I, I, yeah. I haven't heard from. I'm sorry. I haven't heard from any of you guys that the currently existing maximum size for the signs is a problem. It seems to be big enough to get the information across, like, yeah. and that, I'm sure that's been. Jack said it was right on the edge. Okay. Yeah, right. I, I, no, it's right on the money. Okay. And so, yeah, I mean, it's hard for us to work in that realm, but there's enough there to deal with. I mean, multi-tenant signs are always difficult for us. And frankly, one of the things we do as a sign business, five words or less is best, seven at most. People read and I bites. You don't need this catalog of services offered, you know. Sears doesn't print its catalog on its sign. You need instead to know where you're going and get there, and that's something that we're constantly working with. The graphic designer will show the customer what's necessary inside the space to get them there, and you need to leave some of this stuff out. What does it take to locate the people into the space? And so that immediately solves the problem. Erica. If that's the direction that the assembly wants to go, I think we're going to need to, A, provide some clarity to what is an architectural feature because if you look, at, I mean, calculating sign area is very complicated. And if you look at what the rules are right now, it is my contention that the um, to continue common sign was calculated in error because if you look at the the pictures there, yeah. it shows that the frame is part of the sign area. You, you get, I mean, all signs have text and they have pictures. Some signs have pictures and they have empty space. And so what empty space is sign area and what empty space isn't sign area? And if you, you know, pull your, so your words out and they're a different material and you mount them to the background, do you then count the background as opposed to if they're somehow printed on the background? I mean, it, it gets really complicated. And so we tried to... We, we tried to put a box around it, you know, here's what counts as sign area, but if frames are going to be considered potential architectural features, we're going to have to do some more amendments. But is, is that really, I mean, as I look, it looks like on this Takatnu sign that uh, there's a black area that surrounds the sign that incorporates all that, that is actually the frame. That's what holds the sign yeah. basically together. Right. Everything else, the, the metal area, what looks like metal, the gray area, seems to be just visual enhancement of yeah. aesthetics. Take a look at the, the pictures that are coming around. And if, if I could add something, sorry to interrupt. Yes, please, please, if I could add something, um, well, by the time that diagram gets to you, uh, guys at the end of the table, I think we're all talking about the same thing, which is how can we ensure aesthetically pleasing signs that you guys do a great job of, but also have language that's clear. And, and the challenge, I think, is illustrated in these pictures. So if you could look at the pictures and help us as a group develop language to articulate what we're all trying to say, um, that would be really helpful, I think, moving forward. And it is going to require some additional work. But at the end, it will make, I think, the code reflect the values that you guys are, are talking about, which is making great signs but not going overboard in measurements of what our, I think everyone here says from common sense is a is an artistic flourish, if you will. Um, so take a look at that diagram, and and we may not be able to accomplish it right here, but I think the, the intent would be to help us develop some language that captures that. I think yeah. we're you know that pretty well. Okay. Yeah. All right. Clarity. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I, I, I just hope we don't overcomplicate it. It's to me it's sounding like we're almost wrapping up some sort of Well, uh, just just to but, go back to oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but and, and but if you're if you're going to come up with language again, the other aspect of this and with that sign is is the logo, and how much of that within the sign is an art, and how much of it. I mean, it could be a logo, could be a flourish around the sign. So I I, I just would be interested in you addressing that also. So as I'm, I'm, Jack, did you have a comment? Just a quick one, just because I deal with Sonnet all the time. She's the, one of the reviewers on zoning. If she cannot determine the difference between the flourish and the cabinet, she will do it all as the sign. She doesn't hesitate. She says, you have to define this part, that this is the pole cover. She, 
the people at the counter are very restrictive to the letter. And they have no problem saying, no, the sign ain't this big. It's actually this big because we can't see where the pole covers are in relationship to the sign. They, they deal with it that way. So, so, so we could be overcomplicating. We have to, we have to, I just want to let you know that we have to show that this is the pole cover because she will add everything there to determine the, the total of the sign. So. Okay. So as I'm, as I'm hearing, just to articulate for the record, I'm sure Mr. Hall is going to listen to the meeting afterwards. He couldn't be here today. Um, but to articulate, what I'm hearing is the industry would like to have some sort of definitive, this is how big my sign can be and you would like to have a separate ar architectural feature called out saying this is how big my architectural feature can be. Yes, yes. That's right. Okay, so when I look at this amendment, um, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but when you see no larger than necessary, that language makes you a little uneasy. That's not Correct. about architectural features. No, 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 no. No, we're talking two things. We're talking sign, sign size and we're talking architectural features. So this amendment as it is, is something you're not necessarily comfortable with. Uh, the, the sign size is actually a calculated formula. I think you said that is for the menu board. Right, the menu board. Which is the difference. Well, this is the one yeah. I know. Because I would never propose that for I this. Know. I know, I know. Well, that's why I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to lay out both, or all three, four items and call out what we're talking about specifically. Because if somebody's not sitting here with us and they're trying to listen to the tape later, it's going to be difficult. To tell you the truth on menu boards, 99% of the menu boards are shipped in from commercial accounts down to lower 48 so we receive those and install them for Starbucks or McDonald's so they have preset sizes that they could order from from their catalog so there might be three sizes you know or, or three different menu boards that they can choose from and, and they do the appropriate ones but they don't look at our code and say oh we can maximize that to the size they don't do that they're just this is what they order this cookie cutter so um, as necessary, opens it up so that there's. I, I've never seen one that comes with a big old logo on it. I just never seen it. They might have a like an emboss effect behind it that has it incorporated into the design, but you really don't notice it off site. But I don't know the best wording for that. Mr. Training? So you don't design any of these, they're already pre designed in the company? Yes. The franchiser orders it? Yes. Okay. Are there standards out there for <coughs> what they look like? I'm trying to figure out how we help our planning department. That is tough for me because I, I get them all the time. They have them all that we've done for Starbucks, for Taco Bell. Those two probably have a little more branding in them than, than a lot of them, Taco Bell and uh, uh, Starbucks, because you know when they're clearance bar, they put a little Starbucks emblem on the top of the clearance bar. They have a little logo on the menu board you know I, I, not real big it's I've never thought of it as even being assigned to other than just for the people driving up to, to answer your question I don't know how we'd be able to get them all because you know you get a new business coming in you got a whole brand new realm of uh, what their corporate standards are but they are market driven and they're market driven because it's what they can get with that small vision in line of sight yeah. As you're driving up to order, so there's you're looking out your window. And yeah, there's, so there's. I mean, the, the limitation is really our vision versus the sign ordinance. I just don't see it being an issue. That's why that that verbiage there. You know, it, it's tough, possibly at the counter, but like I said, it's all coming in, ship in, so it's already being predetermined. And I've never seen any that looks like wow, they, how they how are they getting away with that? Anything like that, but. I don't know how to put that into words to... Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I, I just wanted to piggyback on uh, some of the things that you mentioned. Uh, that if, if you're a franchisee, you don't have a choice of what kind of sign that, that you can put up for, for your drive through They're going to tell you what the sign is. They're going to design it for you, and they're just going to send you a bill for how much you pay for it, and then and you have to find a local sign company to put the sign up. 
and so so I you know the, and they those are all national standards that those signs are built to so I think as long as as is uh, you know our ordinances meets the national standard uh, I, I think we're we're going to be okay Chris you mostly answered my question that I'm going to ask, but I'll ask, extend it to include you as well. I, I agree, these are all, typically these are corporate issued manufactured signs, but have there been examples in the past of perhaps of a local entrepreneur who created their own sign, who it was egregious and had this horrendous bright sign oriented towards the street and had LED lights, etc. Have there been examples of that? I just don't know. I have never, I don't even know of any local ones that have a drive through to tell you the truth. Okay. The, uh, the few that I've worked oh, with yeah. have a drive through I think the one on Arctic. Arctic. Yeah, I, yeah. All those coffee kiosks technically would fall on their menu boards are often yeah. on the side because this is not just the electronic yeah. ordering yeah. board, it's yeah. also the menu boards which are on the side yeah. of the yeah. Yeah. So you would have some local. Five by five. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm not aware of it. Okay. What's been our big issue with coffee shops is when they want to put a raucous blinky light on the thing, and, and that that's a violation of code. And I do a lot of those, and we sell warning lights, and we tell them you can't put it on there. And when they put it on there, it gets removed mm -hmm. real quick. Okay. Uh, so those those are probably the only example I can think of that's local and. Um, they're so tight with their money, they're more interested in putting the number of drinks they can put on there and living the size of their logo. That logo gets, there, there's a whole set of definitions for those little places that um, does a very good job of constraining the size of the graphic that okay. dominates the building. All right, thank you, I just was curious. Mr. Evans? Yeah, just the, the language that I proposed for the amendment, it's not based on any science or anything. What it was trying to gear against is, because I don't think there's a problem with menu boards generally, um, but it was to guard against the outlying possibility that Taco Bell goes crazy one day and starts <coughs> building menu boards that are twice as big as everybody else's menu boards and you know with the idea of maybe using it as advertising and it gives the the planning department in that instance I think the ability to say well you don't need it to be this big it's not as big as necessary for its function because we have you know tons of other menu boards that serve the same function that aren't as big it's not specific but the burden would basically shift to Taco Bell and say, no, this is, it has to be this large because we've got, and, and the thing about these things, and maybe the technology changes over the next 10 years where those things get a little bigger. Um, and so it doesn't specify a size, but it kind of keeps everything within the same range. Uh, I guess they all could start getting bigger, but then they all have the burden of saying that we have to have it this size for this reason. That's the intent. It's not art, and I'm sure it's could be abused. But sure. Well, and and then again, then it goes back to and and I know initially when you're speaking, you're talking about giving flexibility because you like the architectural features. No, but I'm not talking about architectural features. I know, features. I know, but you were talking different thing. Well, I know it is, but when when I'm talking about mentality and why we're doing what we're doing, then um, when we're talking about that, we didn't want everything to look the same. But then when we shift to this, now I'm hearing we're we're basically passing a law to prevent something that hasn't happened yet because we're afraid where history shows that we, we just don't have cases of that now so I, now I'm getting a little um, I have a little bit of trepidation in that I don't want to I, I you know sometimes we we get reactionary because there's one bad actor out there but in this case I don't even see an example of that so I'm not quite sure um, I'm not quite sure it's worth it, frankly. What are we talking about? The architecture features? No, now I'm back to the menu boards. Because I said, you know, under the architectural features, I can see your rationale in that you wanted uh, to make sure that people could be creative. Right, right but now. But now with these, I'm seeing the motivation being more of one that's just being cautionary and trying to prevent something that hasn't happened. Yeah, there is, there is currently no regulation in place at all, I believe, with respect to menu uh, ordering boards. And I think the planning department wanted to put something in place so that there was some, you know, um, limitation um, out there, um, which I thought was overly restrictive. But, sure, um, sure. I'm just trying to see where we're going with the different. Madam Chair, maybe a, a way to illustrate it. 
If you think of the Village Inn at the corner of Arctic and Diamond on the southwest corner, um, this is how planning allocates. When the sign, you know, they don't have a drive through first of all, but they do have an illuminated message board that is oriented directly into the intersection with a changing message. It occasionally presents stuff about menus, but it is regulated because it's it's marketing. It's marketing to the passing public, not to the people in the queuing lane. Um, that's regulated as a message board sign, and there was no ifs, ands, or buts about that getting passed off as anything else. And, and I think that is a clear illustration where staff would look at it and go, you know what, that's marketing to the public, not transmitting information to people who are already queued up to buy from your business as a menu board. And th th that's a clear illustration of where the boundary. That might actually help with the verbiage that you guys are looking at. Yeah. yeah. But that's one that you see. In, um, it, it's really obvious that it's not a menu board sign, but it is illustrating what, what's available on the menu there. So it gets regulated as a message board advertising sign for the business. That's where it's crossed the boundary line. And it's really easy. Staff, if, if I was staff, I'd look at it and go, that's aimed at the street, that's not aimed at people in the queuing lane. Can't do it. So if you make a sign so big that it's aiming at the street as well as the queuing lane, <laughs> then you have you have a discussion. You know, it's exceeded the boundaries. It's not it's outside of what's visible in the window. Eric. <clears throat> so leaving out this issue of the size of the logo. I haven't heard anyone say that 50 square feet isn't big enough, and we could certainly, if we wanted to spend the time and resources, we could go back and find these permits and measure them and, and that sort of thing. Or So that would be one possible way to go forward is to kind of have staff present that 50 square feet is adequate. Or we well, could it's just... 50 square feet or 50% of the sign? No, I, I'm on the menu board and screen. Yeah, yeah, we keep jumping yeah. back and forth. That's why I keep trying to articulate. Or, we could just increase it to a size that we're sure is okay, or we could just say there are practical limitations on these things based on how much you can see out your window when you're that close, and just say, look, these things are allowed. And, and we don't need this as large as necessary because that just adds this kind of weird complication of, well, is it really, I mean, when what we're hearing is, there's a practical limitation that they're not going to exceed. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so, going almost, yeah. Like so um, what we're looking at, we're looking at page two of five of the ordinance right here. It's section G. And we've had a lot of discussion within this committee, um, specifically relating to order boards, about the 20% logo size. So many assembly members have, have articulated the fact that we should just cross that line out and take out the 20% logo because if it's an ordering board, the intent is to market what's being sold, right? So the logo, I mean, the, we do, I believe, that the, that the um, industry will regulate that. I mean, if the point is to order stuff when you're driving through, you're, if your logo is this big and all the fonts this big, you're not gonna sell as much or it's gonna be difficult. So anyways, there's been some of us that have had that discussion. So what Eric is talking about is specifically the 50 square feet on that uh, menu and ordering board screens. Now, from your perspective, John, you look like you have something you want to say. Well, I, like I said, what if I were to bring in, let's say, the Taco Bell, what they present. They have like the pre-menu, the menu, and they have the clearance bar, and you take that as a standard and maybe give it an extra 20 square foot or whatever, and then that's your parameter to go by for. Um, square footage going forward that whenever a, a tenant comes in they have to fit within this certain size. I think that's what you're looking for, right? The, well, size, the size of the logo that can be on what I'm, it. What I'm saying is either let's put in a maximum size that we're measuring to or let's just say they're permitted at whatever size they come in. Sure. One or the other. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of what I'm proposing. Yeah, I, and I understand where you come from because yeah. you have to determine this and then you know, so the there's question, that fine line sometimes where is it directed, is it not directed, then and, you have to make if, that decision. And, yeah. If we're pretty comfortable that it's not going to get abused by by these companies, then let's just not regulate it. And it, it sounds like staff is already doing that because if it, it does get abused, then it becomes a marketing sign versus and I think a menu. what Mr. Yeah. Skinner is saying we'll be able to determine yeah. no that is clearly advertising off-site right. and and I we can, can then address that separately right. C Street and I'm going we have the bar. definition that 
it says yeah. what it is, and we can right. keep with the definition, yeah. but not regulate the yeah, sign. Yeah, I think we're I think we're getting very okay. So moving forward, so Erica, we're talking about a path forward here, and you were so good at getting us back on track. Um, so, what is? I, I'm still waiting here from the industry. What is your what is your desire specifically relating to this particular ordinance that's in front of the assembly? If you had to ask us, please do this or consider this, what would it be? Non-regulation on the on the boards. Yes. I just yeah. wanted you to say it on the on the record. <laughs> Non-regulation on the venue boards. The venue boards and clearance bar, the package they're on stuff. Yeah. And there's already language that relates to directional signs on the property and how, so that clearance bar integrates into that. That's part of that. Nobody wants to have businesses getting ripped apart by large trucks driving into their infrastructure. Right, Chris. Just so, just to clarify, um, I'm on page two with you guys. Uh, what staff's proposing, what I think you're proposing, is it would read G, uh, item G: menu boards and ordering screens. In addition to a, other allowed building and freestanding signs. Restaurants with accessory drive through service may have menu boards, period. And ordering screens and clearance bars. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, doesn't that fall under the, uh, the miscellaneous signs of building? And, or do we need to specifically include those? It, it wouldn't hurt to include it. Okay. Just, yeah. So, Erica, what was the, I didn't hear you. You said menu boards and ordering screens. And clearance bars. And clearance bars, that's part Which we didn't have in there before. And ordering screens. Yeah. And clearance bars. Period. And then leave the food and beverage. Um, or just leave. No, it identifies many boards later. We could say restaurants with accessory drive through service and food and beverage kiosks okay. may have these things. I can type it up for you. If I you was want. hoping you would. Sure. I was, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Um, does that sound uh, um, agreeable to the uh, people that actually do this every day? Okay. And I would like to get an uh, assembly member comments on that proposed amendment. Mr. Evans. Yeah, I'm in favor of that. Ms. Johnson. Uh, good to me. Okay. And because of what we went through at the last meeting, I am going to um, move that as an amendment, or I'd ask somebody else to, I guess, in the chair. I shouldn't do that. And I, I would like a vote on that. You can move it. Can I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fine. And I will move that amendment as a chair. Is there a second to that amendment? Okay. Yeah. I mean, here. No, yeah. we're we're doing it on purpose. We're actually taking a vote because we told us other assembly members were going to be doing this. So this is redundant. I understand, but I'm asking for a vote on that specific amendment. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that amendment has been. Um, agreed to by the Title 21 committee with Mr. Hall being absent. Um, we will present that to the assembly. So um, this ordinance, is there any other, as you've had the opportunity to review this ordinance, are there any other concerns or questions that you have for staff or comments for assembly members? For different things in the, the sign code? Well, this, let's do this one first. This specific one right here, this one just with menuing order forms. And architectural features. Yeah, and architectural yeah. features. I think, it is. I think we're back on that one. Yeah. I think. Yeah. What you might do is you know, postpone this. Oh, yeah. And then get the architectural features. Because I think I think we've all decided there, that we definitely have to address, in addition to the signs, we have to address the architectural features, is what I'm hearing from the group. So, uh, Mr. Evans. Well, I, I'm, I would, if we're going to make motions at, the, at this yeah. meeting, I, I move to um, maintain the language of uh, 21110400A1 as is currently in the code, and um, uh, just delete basically section one from this ordinance and just keep architects creatures the way it is can you let us propose something that maybe is more clarifying to bring it to this committee because we're having trouble determining what an architectural feature is using this language so if we can maybe uh, understanding what I think your intent is if we can maybe bring something back that's fine I, I'm fine with that so 
what I what I think the best path, path forward. We've come to a consensus on the menu and ordering boards. Now we're focusing on the architectural features. Um, so what we'll do is we'll postpone this um, for. Do you want to do? How long will it take you to? Two weeks. Okay. So. <coughs> Um, okay. My son runs up the valley. Mm -hmm. His menu board is controlled by corporate and they're doing the rollout. They've got no control over it all. It's over corporate centers. Okay. And I think that's, we just, just, we just basically um, agreed as a committee to not regulate those, essentially. Oh, but that's your yeah. 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 Okay. Well, as, um, Okay, so Madam Chair, yes. So in two weeks' time, um, staff will come back with language uh, to propose to the committee. Um, she's collecting contact information right now so that these guys can chip in and help with the verbiage. So we'll um, postpone this for two weeks. Yeah. So when this comes back before the assembly for reconsideration, I'll still urge yes on the reconsideration and then a postponement um, um, until the meeting of the twenty the twenty fifth. Yeah. So we will bring this item back up um, in this committee on the 19th. Could be a Friday. Potentially. Hey, Dick, I have a quick question for you. Um, regarding our, did we did we get a, a word back on when, um, I forget his name, the gentleman who did the, the industrial land study, when he's going to be in town? Bill Reed? Yeah. Uh, I can check, I'll check with Tom. Okay. So we'll come back to that. Oh. Erica, I'm looking at the calendar. He was expected to be in the week of August 17th, and so that's why he was. Um, Tom has been talking to Barbara about scheduling a full work session on Friday. Okay, so All right, so then we will bring back up AO 2015-83 with the proposed amendments um, on August 19th here at this committee. Does that sound good? Yeah, unanimous? Okay. All right, perfect. And um, I I would encourage all four of you to attend the August 19th meeting at the same time, 10 o'clock. We'll do this first on the agenda, hopefully get you in and get you out. Um, but I want you to be able to see, and, and you're working with Erica, so um, hopefully we'll have good language. And if there's points of discussion, and if you think it's perfect as it is, you know, you can shoot us an email. Um, and let us know that Davis Johnson. I just mentioned that both Ernie and I will be gone on the night. Oh, you know. Are you going to be gone Uh I think we go the 18th or 20th. Where are you going? Uh, okay. yeah. My last AML meeting. Or um, no, last summer. Is it possible to. I, I would prefer you both to be here. I mean, you know what the amendments are, but. Your insight is valuable. Um, is it possible to do this on 12th instead of the 19th? I don't think so. I have, I've got a big on marijuana right now. We can we can we can weigh in over email. Okay. That could affect the work product. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> we we'll clarify that. <laughs> if you want, I can call you guys. You can call me. I got a speaker phone on here. You guys can be there if you want. Whatever you want to do. Or I mean, if we just see the language. Yeah, if there's a draft that can go around. Yeah, that would that would be great. We'll make sure it gets it gets sent out to everyone prior to the meeting, so you can weigh in. Because I just want to make sure that your comments are noted. All right. So I think that's it for the signed ordinance. Thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, you're welcome. Um, last, is there any comments from the public on the signed ordinance or discussion? Yes, Mr. O'Day. Uh, thank you very much for what you just did today on your own initiative. Invited these four gentlemen. Jack, Jason, John West, thank you for being here. This is the first time the industry or any industry has been at this table in this room talking about 21. I've been coming here for 15 years and this is the first time you guys have been here. Actually, Jeff, that's not right. No, <laughs> Jennifer. But anyways. Yeah. I've been attending this meeting long before you were elected. Well, I could be. Now, thank you, gentlemen. I, when I visit, I'm a customer of these institutions. When I see a sign, what I see is a 
portrait, the painting, the picture. The border is important, yes. But what the border does, as you know, John, focuses meaning on what's on the inside of that manuscript. It's not so important what the border is. The clay sign, I have a trouble with. Color is very important. If you want to focus somebody's attention, what do you do? You put a dark border around the outside. So you focus their attention to what's on the inside. I've gone by that sign, it's a nice sign. But I have a problem with it. I cannot read the name. Because I'm going by there, speed limit is 45. And I see the sign at 45 miles an hour because it's it's off to my side. I can't see it. And when I come in north, north, south, I can't see it. Either. It's a difficult place to have a sign. You guys did an excellent job, but it's a difficult place to put that sign. Just for your consideration, be and planning. I appreciate planning very, very much. It's important that the industry, all industries, be in this room and participate for the discussion of what we just had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for coming. Okay, so we're going to go rapid to fire through the rest. Um, so the preliminary topics for discussion at the next meeting, um, I just put a list of things that I've heard. It's not even a whole list, but what direction does the committee want to go in um, as far as developing what issues to tackle first or what issues to at least talk about first? I know cell towers has been a big discussion. Has there been a... Has there been a issue on accessory building? Yes, in my district. Yes. In, yeah. And and you're not addressing it. You haven't addressed it with your own land use. I haven't addressed. Well, and let me clarify. Last year, it wasn't just an issue in Eagle River. There was three in Eagle River, but there were seven or eight total that had were an issue. So I would say more than fifty percent were not in my district. So, um, Mr. Hall gave me sidewalks. I'm not exactly sure what he meant about sidewalks. I think that's where you put in sidewalks, but there's no continuous sidewalks, but it's part of your permit. Well, it's where you're, for your building permit, you have to put in the sidewalk, even though there's no sidewalks on either side, so no way to get sidewalks for the side of the permit, would be my guess. Okay. I think yes. also, Jennifer, it could be where some legislators given money put a sidewalk in the neighborhood and there's no connectivity at all. Yeah, all I of a sudden you pull from the street. Now it's a sidewalk. Yeah. And who knows what legislators are going to keep giving that money. Yeah. No one knows it just comes down. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking for my sign-in sheet. I think it was down there. Um, okay, so, you know, I can tell you um, uh, power substations, cell towers, monofills, they're all going to be issues. Um, Mr. Hall had sidewalks. Mr. Evans, do you have anything that you can think of that you had on your particular, maybe? Ms. Johnson? Mr. Peterson? Okay, so I propose we start with the fun ones. So I'm thinking um, maybe the topic for discussion is cell towers first. And, um, yeah, oh, marijuana, it's kind of steady on our continuing every meeting we just get an update this meeting I Eric is doing a great job on that so thanks good. okay so that's that's a good idea everyone received the the rough rough draft of the potential ideas going forward in the marijuana ordinance do we want to discuss that next week too okay so Erica for cell towers is it possible for you to give us a little um or have someone put together a little um, PowerPoint for us on basically this is where the code is, this is where we're starting at with cell towers. I know there's been a lot of discussions about maybe making cell towers look like trees or maybe having them have other features to them. Um, but I think it would be helpful for us to have a, a basic understanding of our starting point. Is that possible? For next week? Mm -hmm. 
I'll, I'll, I'll do I'll do better about getting this to you sooner. Um, so cell towers, and then we'll just get a marijuana um, discussion um, regarding land use and that potential draft. Um, and I think that'll be a good starting point for the first two. And then on that one, I, do, I will ask Tom to give us an update on planning and zoning and the land use plan map, um, what their adopted schedule is. So our work session with planning and zoning commission is gonna be on the 11th, which is the day before. So we should have an answer by next week on um, Perfect. Schedule. their schedule. Okay. Perfect, that will be helpful. And um, lastly, uh, Mr. Trainee and I did receive a legal opinion and um, I don't know if they called it an actual legal opinion, but it was a legal opinion to the Department of Law. It's Department of Law. Yeah, stating that um, we may um, ask to, uh, you know, planning and zoning members to sit as ex officio members as part of a work group on this committee. Um, so that's something we're going to have further discussions about. But just to let you know, I know that ha had been raised as a question. Some of us were concerned if they could sit or if it's not sit, and they absolutely can. Um, okay, so as that goes, I will um, finish this today. I'll, I'll send out a new agenda, and I'll try to be a little more succinct in the next two weeks where we can see the potential issues potentially are. Obviously, on the 19th, we're going to bring the sign ordinance back up. Hopefully, we'll have a resolution there and um, we can move on. I think the cell towers will probably have um, a lot of public input, um, which is a good thing. I don't expect that we'll have a draft probably after the next meeting, but it'll be an opportunity for us to really start engage the public and see if we can start getting ideas from people on how they want to see them integrated. So are you, are you going to just have it on the committee or are you going to have the meeting including the, the industry? Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, what I'll do is I'll, inv I'll call the carriers and I'll tell them we're having the meeting and we'll let the department just give us a baseline. This is where we're starting with. And hopefully from an industry perspective, they can tell us the challenges they have with putting them in or, you know, technical issues. They have to be this big because of X, Y, and Z. And um, we can also, I'll make sure to maybe put out a press release or something so the public knows that we're starting this discussion. So. Maybe a homeowner says, you know, well, I'm really concerned about this. And it'll just kind of be a very rough starting point, in my view. That's how I envision it. Yes, Mr. Uh, it may be very rudimentary for everyone else, but it would be helpful to me when we start that discussion if I could have a, a little bit of a, a primer basically on the process that's currently used. Um, I'm not 100% on top of everything that you know, the industry has to go through to get a cell tower place with who it goes to and everything else, that'd be helpful. That's good. So not only what it says in code about it, but which I think it does. Yeah, Mr. Train. To make sure we've got somebody that's well versed in FCC rules, because I know with cell towers, we've had protests before, and they said, well, you have to do within this time limit card of the FCC, and we just need to know what the FCC requirements are, because it, it controls what we can do. Process. We can request um, that Ralph Dwyer from the Department of Law uh, attend because he, I think he's the he's their Talk kind of cell tower yeah. specialist. Oh, that would be yeah. wonderful. And and I'll just uh, I'll circle back back around, Erica, so we can kind of hit the points of making sure we're kind of covering our bases. Like this this group's input would be helpful. That group's um, you guys do this a lot. Okay, so that should be an interesting discussion um, next week. And um, it's it's ambitious considering it's only a week away, but. Um, I think when things really impact an industry, they tend to show up, as you can see. These poor gentlemen yesterday, I called just I yesterday, so. All right, Mr. Reavers, do you have anything before we close? No, I think you made a lot of progress today. Thank you so much all for coming today. And Chris, thank you for coming. Of course, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're adjourned. Amy, do you want a copy of this? Yes.